Hello and welcome to Season 6, Episode 12 of Unlimited Opinions. I'm Adam Bishop. I'm Mark Bishop. And we are, of course, reading James Hitchcock's History of the Catholic Church, uh, this time looking at Chapter 9, uh, Reform and Counter-Reform. Really, the first half of, of Chapter 9 or thereabout. This is a long, complex chapter. I read the whole thing before you told me that we'd be uh, stopping midway through, but uh, it doesn't get any any simpler uh, past the point where we stop. I uh, I've read the whole thing, the whole book, like three times. I'm just going back and taking notes. Uh, oh, I bet. The, the point of my, uh, I just didn't think that we'd be able to fit in the entire chapter in in a reasonable amount of time. Mm, yeah. That's why I said stop there, and also I didn't want to read anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I figured. Uh, well, I mean, it's like fifty or sixty pages, you know, for yeah. a chapter. You know, and it's got a lot of a lot of info. I will note that. Uh, your voice is more appropriate for radio today, deeper. Why is that? Well, I guess because you said you're starting to get a cold. Yeah, that is true. You seem more subdued. That is so, true. I'm gonna have, again, I'm going to have to carry uh, this episode. As you always do. True, true. All right. So <laughs> shall we get started? Sure. Reform and counter-reform. And uh, I'm going to criticize the author a little bit because it, it again kind of jumps around a little bit that's kind of why i wanted to stop uh midway through this chapter because i think he was going to go back through a whole bunch of stuff again or at least that's the impression i got anyway so what, what are we talking about well obviously the catholic reformation and the protestant reformation uh but really it's the early efforts initially it's the early efforts of the cat within the catholic church to reform itself and then all heck break, breaks loose with the protestant reformation and um uh, separation out yeah i, I do, do like his that. i think yeah. we're about to say the exact same thing but the very first sentence in this chapter uh, he says on the eve of the protestant reformation the catholic church simultaneously manifested both deep piety and corruption the religious environment was both rich and confusing which yeah i think i think just about sums up the whole chapter you completely stole my thunder i <laughs> prepared notes and i have that in my notes but that's okay so but yeah that's uh that pretty much does sum- summarize everything and um and uh, but anyway, so the, the a big event in this period of time, we're really talking about early, very early 1500s mm-hmm. uh, when, when this kind of period is beginning. This is what we're looking at. Um, and um, well, what happened in that period of time, the fifth Lateran Council, Lateran five. So that's when um, the, the there were certain. Um, uh, they some some there, there was a bunch of cardinals summoned uh, for a council at Pisa. And I think we talked about that last mm-hmm. then the last chapter, and to counter it, Pope Julius the second, as the author says, who was scare, scarcely a reformer, convened a council at Rome, and that's um, that's the fifth Lateran council. Mm-hmm. Um, so the the author went into some detail with regard to you know the people that were prominent in in in, in Lateran uh, Lateran five, um, and he talks about. Giles, I guess Giles of Viterbo, mm-hmm. who died in fifteen thirty-two, um, kind of like the general of the Augustinians, the you know, leader of the Augustinians, and um, and he had an interesting quote that um, uh, his quote during this this period was: "Religion reforms men; men don't reform religion," mm-hmm. uh, which I think is is a really interesting concept that that you know that if if you're religious principles are are true then you don't need to reform those yeah um but uh and it also is true that you know religion does reform men but it's probably not a rallying cry for making really uh substantial change to the church (laughs) that's your rallying cry (laughs) uh that men don't reform religion but um and then but but there but he i think this if i remember correctly he was uh, pretty critical and blunt, uh, blaming recent pr- popes for the most most uh, of the abuses of the church, and um, and hope for Leo the Tenth, who had then uh, succeeded Julius the um, Second. And um, so there, the, the, this there was a revival during this period of time, uh, with regard to sacred learning and the discovery of the new world. It mm-hmm. kind of marked the beginning of a new era, um, as Giles predicted. And, um, and and combined with that, and, and it's it's really fascinating to me how important historically the decision to b- build the St. Peter's Basilica in Rome 
mm-hmm. and to fund it really was during this period of time because that really seems to have become a catalyst for a lot of this because it just really brought into stark relief um, the money-making operation that was the Catholic Church at the time. So, um, so that you know, the, of course, we've talked about before these the abuses that were that were in place, and, and interrupt me anytime you want to pipe yeah, in. Yeah, no, you're doing great. Um, you know, there were there were abuses at the time that we had already talked about I think, in the last chapter, and um, but the bishops were in, of this latter in council uh, as they would be because you know it's a, it's about power and control to a certain extent. They were yeah. they were really critical of the religious orders. Um, now the religious orders had a had these kind of semi or almost complete independence where they would just be answering to the Pope, and I don't know if there was really a whole lot of oversight because you know that there was not, they were pretty independent of of control, and would result in sometimes scandalous behavior either mm-hmm. financial or, or otherwise or going off the reservation as it as it relates to certain uh, teachings and practices and that kind of stuff. Which does make uh, sense, like the the hostility there is, is, you know, if you have just these separate, you know, like, I guess, sort of islands of theology, you know, you can see it sort of just developing in sort of a wild way, which, I mean, we think we saw a little bit of last time we were talking with, like, the flagellation and everything like that, where you just have sort of these weird kind of kooky practices that aren't necessarily like heresies, um, but are sort of popping up in these these isolated communities at these, like, really complicated times. And so it does make sense for them to be very critical of these, these very isolated communities um, insofar as they're sort of not in line with with everything else sure and and uh agreed and there's also problems with the bishops too because the yeah, bishops oh, absolutely. Are, and there's there's also we'll get to that a little bit but uh i like how the author describes this in the was the next page 249 where it's the latter and five issued a compendium of condemnations against worldly prelates bishops uh neglecting their responsibilities and cardinals living away from rome etc cetera, etc cetera. you know so there, there's a lot of uh, a lot of material uh, there for them to um, talk about because there were irregular ways that they attained their benefices, whether really offices, nepotism, and unchastity, uh, I guess to put it mildly. <laughs> um, it, but they still allow bishops to have two different, is it kind of pronounced benefices? Yeah, benefices. Yeah. Two, I basically, I guess it's like two dioceses or two different office hold, yeah, uh, yeah. that they're holding at the same time, which of course, you know, could cause corruption or, or whatever and but I, I did the, think it was the i think the most fascinating thing that i learned in this chapter was that letter in five the author talks about how again they get stuck in arguing about minutia and one of them was they they decided to uh talk about and and urge the establishment of pawn shops <laughs> <laughs> um as a way to provide uh, affordable loans to the poor yeah. and uh and that's always the argument of the pawn shop lobby, um, <laughs> why, the, why they should be allowed because they are loans of the poor, but they're high. They're really confiscatory rates. And we are talking about well above 25% annual rates. Yeah. So at the same time, you're, you know, condemning bishops for, for heresy or whatever. You're also, you know, deciding that we should promote pawn shops. You know, it's just yes. everything happens at these councils. <laughs> well, the they, big one, the Council of Trent, we talk about later, maybe in the next episode, is like 20 years long. Uh, right. and so there's like three the sessions episode. of it over 20 years yeah there's foreshadowing over the next episode yeah make sure you stay tuned um everybody's like what, what happened to trent <laughs> uh, i you know i did not know is there another historical figure that, that i was not familiar with which is this jimenez jimenez uh, jimenez jimenez jimenez, jimenez. jimenez. Emphasis, emphasis there's an accent on the e that's where you're supposed to put the accent mm-hmm. Jimmy Nez. Yes, Jimmy Nez. Jimenez. <laughs> Jimenez. De Jimenez. Cardinal Francisco Jimenez. Him. Jimen... <laughs> oh my anyway, God. he passed away in 1517, but he was in Spain, mm-hmm. which you might infer from his name. But uh, but he was person personally. Anyway, so the author is mentioning these people because there were reformers at the time, mm-hmm. um, uh, and he was one of them. And uh, in fact, he was the, the, the author describes him as personally austere. And it seems like anybody who actually could run the ship right was always personally austere. Mm. You know, if they were living in wealth, they, they it seemed to be uh, a correlation between that and them not doing a whole lot of reform. <laughs> anyway, so so Jimenez, 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 Jimenez. Uh, 
he warred on as the author said he warred on clerical corruption i like, went to war on him anyway so he, he obviously was uh, very stern about it and i like this example on one occasion he even shipped a boatload of uncelibate priests across to muslim north africa and i wonder if there was a planned thing like were there were there people knowing they were going to arrive or did they just dump them out there and say do your worst or do your best that's a good question know. that's a good question I, I need to read about that because that seems like a fascinating journey <laughs> um and i you know and i think that's a good idea uh we should do that in modern days uh, not, not just like to muslim lands but you know ship them off to some bad place mm. although muslim lands weren't necessarily bad at the time yeah that's true uh they were just muslim mm. anyway so I, I like the idea of rounding them up and just shipping them off somewhere. You send them to China, a, I guess. A, a little, uh, uh, a little uh, bad priest island. <laughs> I think they tried that. I think they called that Australia. Uh, that wasn't just for priests. It was for <laughs> it's true. Uh, that, that is, is uh, it, it was funny. You know, the, the I'm going to bring up COVID. Look at that. <laughs> I'm going I'm to do it in this conversation because you went on this segue. But it, it, it's interesting how they addressed COVID because you would think that a whole bunch, like an island of, of former criminals, like descendants of criminals, would would not want the government telling them what to do as much as yeah. they allowed to do. But I, but there was a commentator from Australia that reminded the audience on this, whatever I was listening to or watching, mm -hmm. that you know there were a lot of prisoners, but you know the jailers lived there too. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all descendants of. Either prisoners or jailers or both. <laughs> and I guess the jailers won over the, the, the uh, anyway. Uh, so then there's another uh, reforming bishop, um, Gian Matteo Gilberti of Verona. Oh, what, what was his personal life like, Adam? Hey, austere. austere. <laughs> An austere personal life. And he had a conspicuous concern for the poor. So he's another example. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Verona. Um, and he believed in uh, evangelism and all that kind of stuff. Good stuff. So there were there were pockets, as the author is pointing out. There was you know people trying to reform and do the good things at, at around the time there was a lot of corruption and other yeah. stuff too. And there were new religious communities that were formed uh, around this time. The Capuchins, right? Capuchins, mm -hmm. Capuchins? Capuchins. I would assume. I always say Capuchins, mm -hmm. like the monkeys. I wonder. Yeah, are the monkeys named after them, or are they named after the monkeys? They've got question. to be some sort of. I bet you they're the monkeys are named after them. Well, he does have a footnote in here. the The word cappuccino, drink of coffee, whipped cream, comes from the brown of the capuchin robes and the white of their beards. So yes. I, I didn't know that. That was, that was an interesting little little fact he included. Thank, thank you for sharing. <laughs> You're so welcome. <laughs> uh, and they were basically like the third branch of the Franciscan orders because mm -hmm. the Franciscans kind of split between the observant and the the conventionals mm -hmm. and these are the third and they they uh espoused radical poverty so you kind of consider them some sort of reforming force and and, and actual poverty not trying to get rich and stuff and then there's yeah. a mention that ursuline sisters were, were created around the same time uh who were still to order this around they were more prominent in my youth because there were a lot of ursuline teachers that taught yeah i think yeah well there's um, the there's the preschool in our but i don't know i don't know if they're all still cloistered when I was a kid, maybe I'm confusing them because there were Ursuline cloistered nuns, which means they didn't come out. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I thought they had the teachers too in schools, but I could be wrong yeah. about that. Because oh, I was, you know, the we we have that Ursuline preschool uh, in our hometown, which I'm guessing was oh, named right. for, for an order of Ursuline nuns, or was they named after. Um, yeah, yeah, I was, I was assume so. Yeah, that was like that was originally at the convent up yeah, on the hill yeah. that the archdiocese sold. Uh, beautiful facility. Uh, but the priest kept raping uh, uh, little boys, and so they had to pay off settlements, and they ended up selling the convent. Wow. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> Is that true? Yes. I yeah, there, know there, that. There, oh, yeah. There's a whole rash of judgments against them. They didn't settlement. They had to, they had to get some cash. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. And also, the the nuns were getting old, mm. and uh, they were not there. They were, you know, they, they kept dwindling in number. Yeah. Uh, and so the... Uh, uh, I shouldn't say the rapacious archdiocese uh, took their property away and sold it. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Anyway, <laughs> then there, you know what I'm thinking of? The school sisters in Notre Dame, uh, SSN. Oh. Those were, uh, as you might suspect, that was a, a order that 
taught in a lot of Catholic schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hosca Sisters of Rosary. Anyway, Hospitalers was the next one. The Brothers of Hospital Hospitellers and the Ministers of Sick. A newer, newer order around this time formed to what were they doing? Were they, oh, they were, they, they were helping the sick. I think they were nursing the sick. I think that's, I think that's the, that was yeah. the whole point. Yes. Their name comes from, from their duties in, in some yes. ways. Hospitalers. True. Uh, and then there's an order of divine love. I've never heard of them. I've never heard of a lot of these people. Yeah, neither have I. You have not heard of them, I take it. I have no. not. I have not. So then there's these three people that were very important around this time. Uh, let me be looking at my notes. <laughs> Gas uh, Gasparo Contarini. Yes. Um, Reginald Pohl and Gian Pietro Carafa. Mm-hmm were uh, very instrumental in, in trying to be reformers, I think, if I remember correctly, if my notes are right. Am yeah. I right about that? Yes, and then they were the three who were the founders of this oratory of divine love, um, who uh, were, I think, more more spiritual, right? Um, yes. In, in nature, a very sort of, um, you know, I, I don't know if mystical is the right word here, but not not necessarily like the, the very structured, you know, um, uh, you know, extreme poverty of the Capuchins, but a more sort of spiritual, uh, I guess, sort of independent-ish um, approach to, to to the faith. Yes. Well, two of them in particular, mm -hmm. Contarini and Pohl, were considered uh, the spirituals, mm -hmm. and they uh, were attracted to the Pauline doctrine of justification by faith, because it yes. demanded an inner conversion of the believer. And they, and you can see this theme coming forward, like with the, like with Luther, Mm -hmm. These guys were wary of the idea of good works, you know, like you could do good works and kind of improve your lot, I guess you'd yeah. say, because they feared and encourage formalism and reliance upon human effort rather than divine mercy, I guess you'd say. And then Carafa, or if I'm probably mispronouncing that, no, I think that's right. Third, the third gentleman uh, was part of the zealots. Mm -hmm. I always have affinities for these zealots of any uh, faith. <laughs> Did Do you? Am I odd that way? Uh, you might be odd, but really? I, I could see where you're coming from. Well, I like the I like the old story of the uh, Israelite zealots. They, that's where they, they they really became prominent for having extreme uh, views because yeah. they were up on I think on a mountaintop surrounded by the Romans, mm. and uh, they they were they they could have surrendered and lived, but they decided to just fight to the death and be yeah. slaughtered. And I think that's really where the word zealot really yeah. got its cachet, its meaning uh, of somebody that would fight to the death. Well, it's kind of related to um, what uh, I think it's Abbott of Abbott and Costello. No, no, that's not what I'm thinking of. Who are the um, not Abbott and Costello? Who are the, the two magician dudes or the one doesn't talk? Oh, Penn and Teller. Penn and Teller. There we go. And and Penn, I think, is like a, a really avowed atheist. Um, but oh, he, he said that he, he has no respect. He respects the people who are religious and try to make other people become religious, but he doesn't respect those who don't proselytize because he's mm -hmm. like, if you believe that this is the truth, why aren't you trying to spread the message everywhere? So he has he ha yeah, I think he would have respect for the zealots, but not necessarily mm -hmm. for anyone else who's kind of just lackluster in it. Um, yeah, which I think it's an interesting way of looking at it, even though he is an avowed atheist. Well, the funny thing is that even the 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 uh, people that proselytize and the people that don't, none of them have any respect for Penn. <laughs> <laughs> they're unanimous they all agree. <laughs> agreed uh unanimous so then we get on to the society of jesus the jesuits my favorite order oh we've now, having, having said that when they started out they were wonderful mm -hmm. they're they're fantastic um i just uh, have a problem with their modern version which yeah. which stands in contrast to their original mm -hmm. uh the original setup really i mean is it formed by saint ignatius uh, Loyola, uh, who is an interesting cat. I got to read the history of it. Actually, I'm going to write that down. I got to start writing these names down because I want to read more about these people and I keep forgetting. Anytime uh, yet you get bored and you don't have any books to read, you just need to listen to one of these episodes and you will have five book recommendations from yourself. <laughs> I have, I have, I think six books going right now. Oh, that's and, good. Um, I need some light reading though, mm. because, because, you know, sometimes you just kind of want to chill out with a book mm -hmm. and all of the stuff I'm doing now is just, it's kind of a chore. That's why they're all lasting, uh, too long, but I have to power through a couple of them. But, uh, the, one of them is the decline and fall of the Roman empire. Man, yeah. It's just a long haul. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, let's get to the point. Um, 
anyway, uh, and, and the way he writes, it's like an older English, you yeah. know, it, 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 the Gibbon who wrote Decline of Fall. And this is kind of, I don't know if it's abridged or if it's just condensed into smaller print. It's usually <laughs> like a three, three volume thing. Mine, one book. I think it's like seven uh, volumes. Usually uh, it's uh, a big, long movie. series. But he's he's got uh, a different way of of describing things, mm. and you really have to you really have to think while you're reading. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I mean, do you ever read a book, and it just kind of flows through like thought, like you're yeah. like you can like visualize it, or whatever the story is, or whatever the information is, you can just absorb it. Mm -hmm. And there's some books that you actually have to concentrate to understand what is being said continuously. Yeah. Do you know what everybody? You know what yeah. I mean? I, know what I don't mean. know if I'm just weird that way, but but so, some books are harder for me to read, and that's one of them. And I'm I'm really interested in the subject, and he he's a great writer, but it's 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 a chore. It's very it's it's work. Yeah, yeah. No, sometimes I know. I just want, I, sometimes I just want to read and just you know relax. Mm -hmm. So a biography of Saint Ignatius would be very light reading for you. Well, it depends. You know, if you if if it's, if it's well written. Yeah, that's you know, true. Like a, I love historical biographies <laughs> because it talks about the person, and he's has an interesting. Anyway, let me get back to the subject. Yeah. Uh, because he was basically a knight, and he had this—he really believed in the code of chivalry, and he uh, was struck by a cannonball, which, as the author points out, was really the end. Cannonballs were really the end of the code of chivalry because he just blow them up yeah. from a distance. Uh, and while he was recuperating, uh, he decided uh, to do something different with his his uh, his life and felt a calling, but he wasn't really certain what that calling would be, mm -hmm. and so he. Uh, decided to be a, a student, and I like this. He he practiced humility. The author says very practice humility by sitting with children to learn Latin, which is really what I'd have to do. Even though I knew yeah. Latin a long time ago, I'd have to relearn it. And then he uh, enrolled in uh, two different Spanish universities, uh, and and you know studied and learned. Uh, and then he went to the University of Paris. Uh, then it was it was then the intellectual center of the Catholic world. Uh, basically, went to university there. Um, and he, and he always, at this time, he always wanted hoped to go to the Holy Land to convert the Muslims. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, what was his plan for that? Because I guess at the point of a sword, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, maybe he thought he can convince them. Um, maybe not, but then he ends up going with companions to Venice mm -hmm. to go on this, this trip to the Holy Land to convert the Muslims. But he got stuck in Venice for a year and yeah. then he realized, yeah, maybe that's God telling me that this is a bad idea. <laughs> And so by this point, he had already been ordained a priest mm -hmm. um, after his studies and all that. And and he certainly was some sort of spiritual leader to those around him. Mm -hmm. And and back when he was in Spain studying, he was given other students advice, kind of like uh, life advice, it sounds like, like as, yeah. a, as an old knight about what they should or shouldn't do. And he ran, got sideways with the Inquisition for a little bit, um, which always reminds me of Mel Brooks' History of the World. Part one, the Inquisition, the musical. Do you know what I'm talking about? I think vaguely. He made a musical number about the Inquisition. It's really <laughs> catchy. It's I, I still need to watch that. I still haven't seen that. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> uh, the Inquisition. Um, anyway, so but he but they were convinced that he was just trying to be a good guy and mm -hmm. he wasn't trying to preach, un mm -hmm. doing unauthorized preaching, which I don't yeah. know what the difference is, but. I guess they realized he wasn't a subversive or something. Mm -hmm. So we, ultimately, going back forward to where he was, uh, he asked for and received uh, official approval mm -hmm. uh, for this or order that basically reported uh, directly to the Pope. Yeah. And and they uh, formed a new rule. So it was a new kind of um, a religious order. But I don't really, they don't, I don't know if they really explained why it was so different because mm -hmm. they still took the traditional vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but they took a special vow of obedience to the Pope. So mm -hmm. I guess that was the difference. Well, the, the difference, I think, is is they didn't have any like specific habits, um, and they also did not like gather together you know, like in a chapel to, to recite mm -hmm. the divine office. They were actually forbidden to enchant it and, and joined to recite it privately. So it was a much less like structured, I think. It was, it was much less of like a, a regiment that you need to follow uh, in order to become a member of this order. Um, and I think he kind of goes on. You talked about the the obedience a little bit, uh, but the holy pragmatism I thought was interesting. And I thought this kind of ties in to, I think, a lot of your problems with the modern day Jesuits. Because um, yes. yeah. what he kind of says here is, 
Um, in searching for God's will in his own life, Ignatius responded to what he saw as immediate needs as when he gave spiritual guidance to his fellow students. Um, and so basically, um, they, they he says they discerned God's will with severe detachment without regard for one's own desires, exclusively in terms of how one might best promote divine glory. Um, and so the, the whole purpose was to, to for Ignatius to instruct his men to judge the most effective way of winning people to the church, sometimes boldly and sternly, sometimes softly and by indirection. Um, that listen much, say little um, sort of command. So like, just just change your teachings to fit the people um, is really where he's kind of coming from, you know, meet them where they're at, uh, sort of that attitude. Um, and I'm sure you have some thoughts on how that develops into the, the current state of the Jesuits, which you're not too happy about. Well, I don't, I don't even know how it developed into the current state of affairs yeah. of the current Jesuits. They're just uh, borderline blasphemers. Mm. And, and the, the listen much, you know, say little, is the exact opposite of what the, sure. the modern day Jesuits do. I mean, there's, there's a Jesuit publication and, um, and maybe I shouldn't have done it. talk about the specific priest, but he's, he's all over Twitter. And, and if, and I don't post on Twitter, but I, I lurk and I look on, and, and this guy is just so offensive. Uh, and so anti-Catholic in many respects, uh, but also so saccharine in his self reverence, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, uh, and, uh, claimed piety. It's just, uh, uh, vomit inducing to mm -hmm. me and, and th this lack of pragmatism, mm -hmm. spiritual pragmatism and, and, and the emphasis on education and, and what, what works, uh, which I really believe in. And I think, and I think that's what made them so, uh, so strong and they grew so fast. I think or I wrote it down. They, they grew to like 16,000 by 1627. They had 16,000 men as members of this order, which is a huge growth from absolutely nothing in early 1500s. I mean, it's probably one of the, the biggest, like just organizations total in the world, just by sheer amount of men, a, a part of it. That's not like a military force of some kind. Right. And then he, he sent off his, his buddy, uh, St. Francis Xavier, mm -hmm. to the uh, Far East, never to return. And and he was out there uh, spreading the word. And then because of their emphasis on uh, well loyalty to the Pope mm -hmm. and their emphasis on education and their emphasis on um, speaking little, mm -hmm. uh, they ended up being um, quite often um, papal uh, representatives yeah. to other states or to, to other leaders because they knew to keep their mouth shut mm -hmm. and they were talking to the Pope and they won't go off the reservation, so to speak. Uh, so there's so much good that they did. And they said they formed all these universities. I mean, there's uh, even in the United States uh, to modern times, more modern times. I mean, there's the university of Loyola, Chicago, which wa was a great university mm -hmm. uh, university of Loyola, Loyola in uh, New Orleans was a great university. I have a friend at the, the university of Loyola in Chicago from, from my graduating class. Yeah. And they, and they used to have really, really excellent law schools, um, and, and they come out. But, um, you know, of course, I'm down on um, higher education currently because they've devalued their standards, which which is anti-Jesuit. Yeah. So the Jesuit priests were always known as the biggest taskmasters in education, period. They were just known for that. If you had a Jesuit priest, you knew you were in for it. Um, but um, be, because they were so demanding and they ex expected excellence and they, they had had uh, completed education, they were very well learned and everything. And I don't know uh, that that's true of the, the modern day Jesuits um, in the, you know, in, in today's world. But no, uh, I think if you were forced to be reckoned with back then. Yeah, I was going to say, I think if you if you take that attitude of like that pragmatism, of like, you know, using sort of the, the, the means of the world to, to attract people, you know, to the faith and you're not necessarily like playing into their beliefs, but, but, you know, not, you know, being so like, not, not trying, like making a point to not estrange yourself from the people. Right. I think it's kind of the attitude of that holy pragmatism right. sort of to meet them where they're at. And I think now we've gotten into the, to the modern Jesuits where it's, well, now we've become, I guess, sort of part of the, the, the common people, because I know a lot of your issues with them are they're just so left wing in politics and all these social issues. And I think that's part of it. It's like, oh, we, we need to lean into this. You know, that's that's what the true Catholicism is, is, is we need to meet these people where they're at. And that's just over time morphed into just this like, well, we need to meet these people where, we're, where they're at and accept their beliefs as part of our own. And I think that's where we've kind of gotten to the point of, of the modern Jesuits today. I guess you guess. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what. Yeah. what I mean, I mean, that's just my point theory. A to point B. I mean, it, 
uh, I'm not arguing with you. I think it's a, it's a great argument. Um, but uh, I, I really just don't know. I just know that uh, modern day Jesuits are just. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. We done with the Jesuits or you know, is there anything so, else you want to talk about them? No, well, they'll, they'll come up over and over again throughout this. Sure. But... Yeah. Uh, great group. And it was, it, it was neat that the, it was formed by a guy that had, had been in battle, mm-hmm. you know, as a, as a knight, essentially. Uh, and, and the author indicates that he may have been, somewhat of an inspiration to the character in Don Quixote. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you caught that, but anyway. So, uh, all right. So then Protestant Reformation. So what happened? Um, well, I don't know. Let's, let's uh, explore. A whole lot of stuff very quickly. So as the, the author says, uh, as Lateran, uh, Lateran 5 drew to a solemn close in 1517, Giles of Viterbo was doubtlessly unaware that as general of the Augustinians, he was the ultimate superior of a man who, within a few months, would ensure that most of the council's decrees were forgotten. <laughs> so who's that Augustinian monk? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Luther, of course. He passed away in 1546. And, and uh, that's a guy who uh, really, through his own uh, intellect and bravery, changed the world. It, mm-hmm. it just I mean, he, he, he is... One of those historical figures that it's not, I don't, it doesn't, I don't think that you can say, well, he had, um, you know, these armies behind him. He was born to wealth or whatever. I mean, he really just believed in something um, so strongly and kept going <laughs> with that theory uh, to the, its logical ends or illogical, depending on how you look at it. And uh, very, I mean, just fascinating how much he was able to, one man can change the world. But as the author mentioned, um, if it weren't him, it might have been somebody else because all these forces were being um, brought to the forefront. It's almost like all these different flammable liquids were being poured into a pot. Mm-hmm. And then um, this this one monk lit the match and boom. So what was the match? Well, let's uh, talk about the the man. I mean, what, the, as, as the, the author uh, has this te- section entitled The Monk. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, he was he was an austere person it seems like <laughs> <laughs> and uh it, 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 he, he was he was in many ways a medieval man as the author says and taking for granted the monastic life was the highest way of living the christian life and so he's in the monastery uh augustinian he ends up taking a trip to rome and i don't i couldn't and i don't know a lot about his details uh, did he go to lateran 5 was he there it seems it seems implied that he was he traveled there for for I lateran think 5 so. I, don't, I, don't I don't think, think he was there okay so but he did travel to rome uh at some point and he was scandalized by the worldliness um uh even the apparent blasphemous skepticism of some of the clergy mm. and do you think do you think that if you you personally adam went to rome you might be scandalized by the worldliness and apparently blasphemous skepticism of some of the clergy there. What do you think? Um, I, think maybe. I think maybe. I think it's a possibility. A I think possibility. I'd be too distracted by all the cool stuff they have in the museums. Ooh. Well, like if you went there and, and you could talk to them candidly, mm. uh, I bet I, I bet you'd be scandalized. Probably. Probably. I don't know how it would not happen. Mm. There are so many millions of dollars flowing through that place. Uh, and not just going to charitable. Anyway, I won't go on that rant so much. Anywho, I think they all ought to go to jail. Every one of them. <laughs> um, I don't think there's a single person in, in the Vatican that's not corrupt. Yeah, I think it's possible. It's possible that there's a, a single person? I think that there, there might be one or two, maybe a janitor. I was going to say that. They've got to have staff mm-hmm. uh, that are decent people. Yeah, just some poor Italian, Italian guy, guy. yeah, who got a Italian job. Guy. Yeah, just doing his, doing his job. There probably are a lot of like good ushers and stuff, like mm-hmm. people that work there. Like, Father, do you really think you need a suitcase worth of euros when you go over to Switzerland? Well, I'm going to meet some ladies. Um, <laughs> that cocaine doesn't free. Uh, <laughs> uh, you think I'm joking? No, I'm not joking. Because <laughs> uh, there's a couple of priests that got got nabbed crossing the borders. You know, they're not like you know they're basically open borders now. 
Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes they get alerted, you know, like uh, they got drug dogs too. And, you know, know, cocaine Mm -hmm. uh, is so often uh, used or snorted or sorted or whatever with dollar bills or euros that Mm -hmm. if you have enough of them together, uh, there's the trace amounts of cocaine on them that drug dogs Mm -hmm. will alert on on just cash money, hundred dollar bills or euros, I suppose. And uh, I don't, I'm not sure that's how they got caught, but they're like, uh, Father, why do you have $3 million worth of cash in a bag, in a satchel? Why, why do you have that? What is going on? Uh, I'm collecting donations. <laughs> I'm going back to the Vatican. Anyway, so back to Luther. Mm-hmm. Luther is not guilty of sacks of cash. Uh, he was educated by the Brethren of the Common Life, which was, I think we talked about that last chapter, seemed to be very influential educators in that era, that uh, region. Mm-hmm. And uh, he translated the Bible into German, but probably not the first one to do that, but that's a pretty big accomplishment in my book. Uh, but he translated it from the Vulgate, not from the Hebrew or Greek text. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of interesting. I don't know if he, if he knew how to read and write Greek. Mm-hmm. But um, anyway, others were doing that at the time. But he was, um, you know, Luther became convinced that the scholastic theology that, that we talked about last couple episodes of Christian teaching, which was more like Aristotle than Christ. And I think there's some truth to that. You know, you're trying to be too technical and too philosophical about it. Um, and, and, but he had a sense that God was a remote, all-powerful, angry, and condemnatory figure. I don't know why I disagree with that. I was about to say, it sounds like you. <laughs> well, I think there's a mixture. I think I think there is. I think I think he's partially right, though. I don't think that... God's all love and roses and rainbows and stuff mm-hmm. because I, I think there is a place called hell, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you got to be condemnatory if you're going to throw people in hell. Mm-hmm. You know? True. People, people uh, were, were aggravating me with that as a prosecutor because I would recommend that people go to prison. And I, I said, well, first of all, it's my job. When you, when you shoot someone, you don't just pay a fine. Yeah. Right. When you, when you murder somebody, uh, you're going to go to jail. Uh, <laughs> well, you're so judgmental. Uh, you're so condemnatory. Yeah. Yeah. I think God's kind of the same way. You go, you, you make certain, take certain actions. You really kind of condemned yourself is my attitude. was. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, you put that, that, that carton in, uh, in motion down that path and you can't be upset that you get to the destination that you, set off for True. anyway so he also um seemed to struggle with a certain amount of despair about um ab- about his beliefs and his faith um because he believed he was uh, damned already you know because they were all sinners and he was a sinner just like everybody else and he and he um uh, but but he had some sort of revelation reading paul's letter to the romans and he was struck for the his author says struck for the first time by what he understood to be the true meaning of the statement, the just man lives by faith. So he's really talking about you just, you just have to focus on faith and not about all these good deeds or all these rules and all this stuff. It's faith that that and by God's mercy you'll be saved. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if it's up to, if God chooses to save you, and there's really not much you can do to make up for your sinfulness, is what I get from him. A little bit of fatalism, don't you think? No, I agree. Absolutely agree. Um, and I think that's something you see a little bit later. I know we talk about him uh, maybe next episode, but with with Calvin especially. Yeah, we, no, um, Calvin's in here. Well, we'll get there. Um, yeah, we'll get there sh- shortly. All right, so let me move along with Luther. Mm-hmm. So, um, so really, I mean, we're talking about. Oh, yeah, they the also said like uh, he believed that salvation was by faith alone, mm-hmm. um, by personal trust in the saving actions of Christ. And Luther believed that the church failed in its most basic task, uh, ensuring people to go to salvation. And, and, and uh, the church really gave them a false sense of their own goodness. He, he really gets kind of down on everybody. Uh, we're all sinners. And we should, it, it's almost like he felt like we're all going to hell, but maybe some of us might get lucky just from God's mercy. Mm-hmm. So quit acting like, uh, you know, this is, this is happy, happy, fun time. And then the indulgences. Uh, the indulgences were were in place before the uh, the St. Peter's Basilica was going to be funded, but they they issued a, a specific edict that allowed for indulgences if if people gave money 
uh, for the building of this basilica. And uh, they were pretty aggressive salesmen uh, yeah. <laughs> at the time. Uh, they, they mentioned by name this Dominican Johann Tetzel, who died in 1519. But it was pretty widespread, and 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 you know, of course, there's there's exceptions if you're too poor, then you just pray for it or whatever. But really, it was a money grab, yeah. and you know, if you you could you could get a certificate mm-hmm. uh, that you that you have these indulgences for past sins because you gave money to the the St. Peter's Basilica, and it, and it's such a terrible, terribly corrupt system and awful, uh, but it also built one of the big, most beautiful buildings in the in the world. Yeah. So there's some good game of it. Anyway, yeah. I so really, that really set him off. Go ahead. I really like the point that he makes sort of at the end of that section where he says, on any list of Catholic, doctor- Catholic doctrines, indulgences would not make rank near the top in importance, but they proved to be precisely the point where the church was most vulnerable because many things came together there in a concrete way. Anxiety about sin and salvation, the credibility of official teaching, the significance of external acts, the rapaciousness of some of the clergy, and the parent sale of a spiritual good. So it's like, yes. you know, indulgences to Catholics really aren't that important it was just such a weak spot for the church because you're at this time when you have all of this corruption, you have all of this just sort of money funneling and you have all of these questions about, you know, well, well how does this really work? And it's, you know, I think a lot of people even still today, like look back on the Protestant Reformation and, and think that, you know, indulgences were this like huge, crucial part of, of Catholic doctrine, Catholic teaching. When really, they weren't. It was just the place where, you know, it was it was the easiest to target. And it was the place where, where like Catholic Catholic teaching was the weakest. Um, and didn't yes. make as much sense as everything else. Yeah, it didn't make any sense. And it, and like the author says, and you point out, it really undermined the the deference mm. uh, to spiritual authority. And, it, and it's similar to uh, like uh, people uh, people nowadays. So like um, uh, like if you have, I'm trying to think of a local s- scenario that I can think of. But like if you have. Um, uh, uh, like a local government uh, that that is spending more than they're bringing in every year. Well, that doesn't that doesn't really get people too excited. I mean, they're like, you know, these people don't know what they're doing or whatever. And if you look at the federal government, but what really gets people is something they can kind of feel or touch, or they 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 can they can grasp instinctively. So, like like, well, I'll give you an example. Like back in Reagan's time, he made a big deal about there was like a two thousand dollar toilet seat. Mm-hmm. So, so literally there, there was a, a, a defense contractor that got paid $2,000 for a toilet seat. And, and that was an example of wasteful spending. And they said, if, if they were paying $2,000 for this toilet seat, imagine what we're paying for the plane, you know? And, and so people can understand, they, people don't understand what, how much is a hundred million dollars for a plane? Well, it's, we can't conceive of that large of a money amount, but you can understand how much a, a toilet seat would cost you at Walmart. And mm-hmm. it's not two thousand, right? And so you can you can get that. I think the indulgences were like that sweet spot where everybody understood. You mean I give money so they could build this beautiful building in Rome for these rich people to flounder around in, mm-hmm. and then you're going to forgive my sins. Yeah. So like if if one of these these rich ass these rich people murdered somebody five years ago, they just make a big fat donation to your church, and mm-hmm. now they're going to heaven. Yeah. I'm, uh, but I might go to hell because I. I use the Lord's name in vain and I don't have money or I, I won't give money for this church. I mean, it was just, it, it, it crystallized everything and undermined the entire church. So I think you I think the point that the author and you are making are absolutely right. This is like a side issue, mm-hmm. but it's a, it's, it's a crack in the foundation and well, it crumbles the whole thing. Well, the example that you gave um, reminded me, I think this came up like in the, in the most recent Republican presidential debate. I don't know if you watched that at all. It's just a complete, complete mess. It's just so obnoxious. Um, but this was a point that Ramaswamy made to, to Nikki Haley, and they went on for like two minutes about it. It was just ridiculous. He's like something about she had ten thousand dollar curtains in one of her offices when she was in some like federal position. He's like, well, you had ten thousand dollar curtains in that office, blah 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 blah. And of course, Nikki Haley's like, that was the Obama administration who put those there. That wasn't me. And it's like nobody really cares about the curtains. But it's the right. exact point you're making about the the toilet seat or the or the toilet or whatever, where it's like you're spending this amount of money on this. You know what what are you really doing? And of course, they get in this weird talking over each other at this this debate where they're supposed to be focusing on like the big issues facing our country, and they're 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 like bickering about ten thousand dollar curtains. Um, right. But it's like it's and the point that he was trying to make was exactly what you were saying is it's just right. he was trying to highlight you know how this would look to the average person. 
Yeah, and that, that's what you that's what you try to do is you try to use an example that people can understand and, and focus on uh, as as a as a kind of a talisman or an example or or something that defines the other person. Mm-hmm. And, and and it's effective and you need something like that, like if you're in litigation. So if you're doing a jury trial, people you know, the other jurors get lost in, in all the evidence and a lot of it can be boring. But you have to have, I call it a hook. You have to have a hook. Mm-hmm. Uh, a part of the story that they can believe in and they can root for or root against. And if you don't have a hook, you don't have a, you don't have a case. Yeah. Um, so th- this kind of was like the ultimate hook because it, it was, it was not part of the fundamental uh, belief system. And also you can oppose it without being anti-Catholic. You mm-hmm. know, you could still be a devout Catholic and follower of Jesus Christ and just not like all this corruption that's you're selling this stuff for sin. You could be more devout than the priest mm-hmm. by saying you shouldn't be collecting money for this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so I think that makes it even more powerful because the opponents to it are right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so then there's the famous 95 theses, 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 theses. Uh, uh, points, 95 points. And he may or may not have, uh, nailed to the front doors of a church mm-hmm. when he was a professor at the university of Whitgard, um, Wittenberg, Witt, I'm sorry, Witten, Wittenberg. There we go. I apologize. Um, I don't know why I said that anyway. And it was a, an act of defiance, of course, and an invitation to debate on that issue. And he was, he was so felt so strong about it. He thought, because he thought people's souls were at stake. I mean, how can you, how can you claim to, be granting people forgiveness for sins because they give money. I mean, mm-hmm. what they should be doing is, is telling them, repent, you sinners. Yeah. We're all evil and we're all sinners and we all should be somber. I mean, and um, and it, it, there's a section here about the cheap grace, you know, like you're trying to cheap, you know, give people grace on the cheap mm-hmm. uh, where you're not having to uh, reform yourself. You're not having to uh, redeem yourself. You just, you know, do this on the cheap by making a donation. And, uh, so, you know, that's where it was. And, and the, the, the funny thing was Pope Leo X thought this was just some sort of monkish quarrel, as the, as the author says. Well, it's just an intellectual argument between these guys, like how many angels are in the head of a pen. Yeah. But well, problem, again, it's, it's like indulgences didn't seem like anything, I'm sure, to the Pope. It was just like, well, this is just something we've done for a long time. It's not a core doctrine. You know, why would we get rid of it? Why do I have to look into it? Yeah. And um, uh, what he didn't count on is the printing press, because... <laughs> Uh, there were other people that had criticized this practice before, like the, the, the Huss people, the Huss and the followers. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the printing press meant that everybody could have access to this and more people could read, too. Um, and so it wasn't just a dispute between Augustinians and Dominicans. It was, this was a fundamental uh, argument about uh, you know the propriety of the church. So then Luther ends up going a little further, though. So he ends up really breaking with the church. Uh, under more fundamental terms, which is uh, sola scriptura, which is, you know, the scripture is the ruler uh, of the liturgy. And um, and also it's a compelling argument. You know, I mean, it's an interesting argument. Well, you know, it's, it's not the church that decides uh, what um, what the teachings, teachings of, of Jesus are. It's a scripture. Mm-hmm. And, and if, if that scripture is different from... Um, then the Catholic Church's teachings, then the Catholic Church's teachings are wrong. Mm-hmm. But of course, how do you how do you how do you interpret Scripture? Isn't one of the biggest problems? But so he he ends up publishing a, a, a number of pamphl- pamphlets. I think it was three of them. Set forth his basic theology, which sharpened his attack on Catholic doctrine, as the author points out. I'm at two fifty seven at this point, and then and he's accusing them of uh, you know like indulgences and purgatory itself were devised by the church authorities merely to control the gullible people and extract money from them. Well, that goes a step further. I mean, I'm, I'm being pretty critical, but he went, he went for the jugular that it was, they intentionally created these Mm -hmm. concepts, especially purgatory to just, you know, uh, control them, fool them and get their money from them. Mm -hmm. And that's a step further than saying, Hey, this is a wrong practice. We need to tell people to repent rather than, you know, donate uh, to try to get God's favor. Which, you know, okay, well, maybe maybe it'll work. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, any thoughts about that, or should I keep moving along? I mean, I think we're going to kind of get into this a little bit later, um, but I do think it is 
it is ironic when he's talking about this stuff as just being made up by, you know, one man or a group of people, when you consider the concept of, of Sola Scriptura itself, with him personally deciding which books of the Bible should be books of the Bible, because he took out, you know, seven of the books that are in the Catholic Bible. Um, and so mm -hmm. he's like, well, these these were just made up by men. Um, and so, or, you know, whatever, these these weren't, you know, true, true, you know, the words of God. But in doing so, he's putting himself in the same position as the people he's critiquing, right? Because yeah. he's the one who's making the decisions. He's a man who's now interpreting what the the, the word of God should and shouldn't be. Um, and I know we talk about this a little bit later, but there's always going to have to be some sort of power structure to determine that, uh, right? Because it's just, you know, the, right. you know, what is scripture? What is the word of God? You know, how do we actually put that into practice in our daily lives? Um, but that's, yeah, and, you know, we get to that in a minute and I guess we'll get to it right now because the, it's a good discussion to have because it was, you know, he, he also mentioned, well, there's, there's only really two uh, sacraments. The mm -hmm. other ones aren't really in the Bible. I guess the two would be baptism and the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And um, what are the other things? Anyway, he had other, like you said, books of the Bible in different, pre, you know, like the purgatory, I had a whole list I wrote down. Anyway. Here, I, I uh, have it here. What was, what was it? Oh, yeah, if you have it. Yeah. Sure. The, 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 he said, rejecting almost the entire Catholic system, authority of popes and bishops, seven sacraments, mm -hmm. uh, finally from only two, like you said, purgatory, the invocation of the saints, and many other things. There's a whole, whole further list that he goes on. Uh, the mass, um, an entima, monasticism, um, you know, he said that, you know, the very idea of religious vows was fallacious, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's really like a lot of the, the, the stuff. So he went from like the, one of the sort of side notes, you know, as, as we're calling it of, of Catholicism, the sale of indulgences, and then sort of went from that to, um, the entire Catholic system as we know it. Yes. And, and so of course he was excommunicated mm -hmm. and, and I do kind of like Luther's style because he took that, uh, uh, the bowl or whatever, the, the order that he's excommunicated. And he burned it in public. And then he took a book of the canon law and burned that too. <laughs> and so he was brought in front of the uh, the emperor, uh, the king there in that area. And, and, uh, and he stands before them and says, and his quote, famous quote is, here I stand, I could do no other. And um, and, and that kind of unrepentant um, courage uh, of your ideals, well, I find that so admirable. Man, that's, I mean, this guy... And I don't agree with a lot of what he said and a lot of what he did, but you know, he, he had stones, you know, I mean, this, this is high stakes poker, even in that era. Uh, you know, if it was a hundred years earlier, he would have certainly been burned at the stake or, you know, crucified or whatever as a heretic. Uh, but he stuck to his gun. So I got to respect that. But anyway, so the, the one thing, the one argument I thought, I, cause I'm reading through this, I'm like, oh, this guy makes a lot of sense. But then I was reminded in the readings and I'm completely lost where I was in my notes but that because it, there was an argument from another person who argued against him, debated him. It, was it Erasmus? No, I think it was Eck. E -C Eck, that's right. Thank you. And uh, and so Eck was making the argument. I think it was him. Uh, anyway, there was a debate. And he made the argument. Well, you know what? There's a tradition mm -hmm. that actually predates the scripture, which mm -hmm. I always forget about. Yeah. Because there was there was the you know the apostles went out proselytizing. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, Paul was in the early group uh, and was, is known as like the proselytizer. And he's really communicating with all these, these churches and all that, of course, Peter and, and all the other apostles for some period of time. And I don't know that anybody really knows how long before the scriptures were ever written. Mm -hmm. And so they established a tradition, an oral and physical tradition of these mass celebrations, not masses and groups, but like a celebration of mass. Mm -hmm. Um, before scripture was even written. So if there's something in that tradition, is that more or less reliable than the scripture that was written later? And, and the traditions are how you run the church. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a really, really good kind of argument. I've, I've, heard, it, I've heard it summarized um, by, by people recently that, you know, well, well, Jesus didn't come to earth to give us a Bible. He came to earth to give us a church. Or, you know, well, that wasn't the, 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 the complete purpose, but that's what he did. Jesus did not say, okay, here's all of the books of the Bible written down for you. Um, here you go. This is what I have to say. No, he, he built a community of, of apostles. He built a hierarchy system. He gave one guy the authority uh, to, to continue his work after he was gone. You know, he set up this system before, like you said, the Gospels were even written, before like any of the New Testament was even written down. That tradition was started with Jesus. Um, I think things would have been different if Jesus did come down with stone tablets to just had all of the gospels already engraved in it. Um, but that's not what happened. Jesus came down and he he gave people 
the, the authority to continue on in his place you know, yes. to, to call everybody up to heaven. And I think that's that's really, I think, a more compelling argument because that's the tradition that even gave us um, what what the, the Bible even is. You know, it wasn't even for, for 300 years after that, 350 years after that, that we had an agreed upon set Bible. And it was the Catholics who did that. It didn't just come out of nowhere. I mean, it was, you know, years and years and years of tradition, but it was decided by a council um, of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, very well, well said. Thank you. So let's uh, let's talk about, well, uh, I guess I should go back a little bit about his his specific problems. We talked about all those different areas, but he even had a problem with the mass that he, that he, he, he uh, didn't really believe that uh, the mass was a, a sacrifice at that time because there was only really one there was the, the, the there was only one true sacrifice which was jesus so we shouldn't be having this the this uh liturgy that talks about us having a sacrifice um uh, as part of the mass now so that was that was one of them I and mean, he, he rejected so much um he, he after he was condemned uh, uh, he ended up going into hiding so he, he ends up not being a monk anymore and he, he decided that even his very vows uh, were fallacious. I mean, it seems like what 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 happened with Luther is what happened with a lot of people, and happens to a lot of people when they when they're found that their religious leaders are corrupt. Well, it's like they say, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, there's a bunch of dirt in the bathwater, so you got to throw that out. So you throw the baby out with it. That's what that saying means. And, and so you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You want to clean the baby up with a new bath. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to reform what was right about the Catholic Church, it just seems like he just rebelled against everything, including his own vows yeah. as as a Franciscan monk. And 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 you see, and it, it's, I see him as kind of a tragic figure at that point. Um, but again, I need to read a little bit more in detail about his his life. So he, he ends up getting married and have a family. Yep. And he and his family lived in what had previously, previously been his monastery. Um, so I guess he kind of let, must have lived a, a decent life with his, his wife and kids. I mean, and so then the question was, was this a reform or a rebellion? And for him, you know, it, it seems clearly there was a rebellion, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, fundamental precepts, precepts, but there were a lot of people that didn't want to split from the church. Um, and, uh, and they, the, a lot of his followers called themselves evangelicals and not Lutherans because they didn't want, they were indig indignantly insisting that they followed Christ, not a man. Uh, but ultimately they did follow him. Which I you think is, is funny because that's like the, the point I was making earlier. You know, eventually you do have to follow a man, you know, no matter what. I do want to go back to what you were saying about the mass because he makes one point that was interesting that I never heard before. Um, but he, he saw like the Eucharist as just like another good work that made grace too accessible. And I've never thought about it like that because yeah. you know, the Eucharist is such like a central thing for Catholics and it's such like a, a big yeah. deal. Um, but for him, I guess it does make sense. If you're looking at this whole system, you're just like, well, this is just, you know, arbitrary rules and arbitrary whatever set down to, to um, you know, and it's just not how the system should work. Then I guess the Eucharist would feel like that. It would just feel like another sort of, you know, arbitrary practice that we do. And it just makes God too accessible to people. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So then there's a, a section here about the fate of the humanists. So how do the humanists uh, deal with this sort of breach and, and break up? And, um, and so they talk about a couple specific people. Erasmus mm -hmm. was prominent at the time. Uh, he, he at first congratulated Luther, uh, but he considered uh, Luther's uh, basically having heedless divisiveness and dogmatic denial of free will that's a big thing mm -hmm. with the with the, the with the theories of luther is that he just doesn't he doesn't really truly believe in free will it seems like that you're almost like you're you're just destined to be a sinner and, and either you're going to heaven uh, from god's mercy or not there's nothing you do about it mm -hmm. you know as an adult um and that pessimism mm -hmm. uh, uh erasmus was not a fan of the pessimism and neither am i mm -hmm. uh, and and, and I have to I have to learn a little bit more about our Lutheran friends, uh, but it does seem like kind of a sad religion, mm -hmm. doesn't it? It's like, you know. Well, I think a lot of the Protestants fall into that camp. You know, I think you have sort of two different groups of Protestants now. You have the ones that are very extreme, you know, Calvinists, very sort of anti-free will that have that very pessimistic, very sort of human nature's very awful sort of view, and then you have the other, you know, Protestant camps that have just become so far 
you know, left field where they're just like, no, everything's good. God loves you no matter what. It doesn't matter what you do. And I think that's mm-hmm. kind of the state of a lot of the, the modern Protestants. I think too many are, I, I would rather have the former over the latter um, yeah. as the biggest denomination. But I think a lot of people are trending more towards the latter, which is to do whatever you want. God loves you if they're even staying Christian at all. Yeah. So there are others that are mentioned. Uh, Wessel Gan- Gansforth, after his death, his writings were formally condemned. Uh, and uh, let's see, uh, Ruchlin, mm-hmm. uh, although most of his students became Protestants, he remained a Catholic, even being ordained a priest shortly before his death. Uh, Mutinus Rufus at first befriended Luther, but eventually rejected his movement uh, in this skeptical Conradus Celtus, Celtus, mm-hmm. Celtus, Celtus, uh, was condemned posthumously by the uh, Catholics and Protestants. <laughs> That's a twofer. <laughs> How do you manage that? That sounds like something that happened to me. <laughs> Everybody angry. Uh, then there's a discussion of Perkheimer. Um, is a wealthy German humanist, mm-hmm. friend of both Erasmus and Luther. Um, uh, let's see. He wrote to the Pope. Uh, to defend Luther, but seemed not to espouse the fundamental Lutheran teachings, merely demanding that mass be said in the vernacular and communion be given to lady in both kinds. Uh, it doesn't seem too bad. Um, like Erasmus, he cautioned against breaking with the church, accusing some of the reformers of fostering unbridled liberty, calling one former friend Satan, and saying that he would rather live under papal authority than under that of the reformers. So you can see it's like there has to be a, a choosing at this point, because they they, they didn't just try to change some of the practices they're arguing with the fundamental philosophy and theology of the catholic church at this point um and that's that's really what what kind of drove the 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 split at that point of course the catholic church wasn't going to just change the fundamental thinking Mm -hmm. um so then there's uh, discussions of zwingli Mm -hmm. never heard of the guy i've heard Zwingli. you've heard of him yeah because he was the, the the first puritan oh Huh, interesting. There's a parish priest in Zurich, Switzerland. He warned against human innovations in religion. I tend to agree with that one. <laughs> uh, you know, because you know uh, how we to to decide that the religion is should be reformed just as an individual person. His teachings were similar to Luther in many ways, albeit he, re- he rather defensively denied his beliefs owed much to him. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of funny. I thought of it first. And so then there's yeah. <laughs> Uh, that was my idea. Uh, I just didn't think to put the thing in the church door. <laughs> I had 98 theses. I just didn't have the printing press yet. Yes. I got to it first. I had too many typos and spelling. I had to keep rewriting it. Get up there first. <laughs> anyway, Calvin. Calvin, I just don't understand Calvinism. Maybe you can explain this. He was a Frenchman, mm-hmm. uh, and he was uh, among the Reformation leaders. He was a layman, trained as a humanist and a lawyer. Well, that's the worst. Um, he was a student of Paris. He was involved in the evangelical group, suspected of heresy. And they had to flee the city uh, in a nocturnal incident in which inflammatory religious handbills were nailed up all over the city, including on the bedroom door of King Francis the First. Kind of admire oh, that. How did you get access to it? That's pretty wild. Unless you had one of your supporters who's supposed to be his guards, but that's pretty ballsy. So. Um, uh, Calvin found refuge uh, with Mar- Marguerite of Navarre, Navarre, Navarre uh, Francis' sister and queen of the tiny kingdom of Navarre in the Pyrenees. Mm-hmm. Uh, he eventually settled in Geneva, where he was ordained and attempted to set up a model Christian community. A utopia, mm-hmm. if you will. Well, maybe not a utopia, but... But he has this doctrine of predestination, which I just can't wrap my head around. I mean, I guess I understand it. This doesn't make any sense to me. Like God decreed from all eternity that some would be saved and others damned, so that no human effort could have any effect on the outcome. Mm-hmm. And I wonder what's the point. Yeah, I, I just I just don't understand why God would do that. And of course, they would say, "Well, who are you to wonder what God would do?" And blah blah blah. But um, uh, what's his motive? Why would you? Well, I mean, it would seem to be boring. I mean, if, if there is no uh, chance that they redeem themselves or they get worse, then there's really no no true free will. And why would you try to even do good? 
I don't yeah. know. I don't understand though. Did, am I missing something there? I mean, I th- I think it, it kind of ties into the argument we've had, you know, so often of like, you know, the the, the you know, um, omnipotence and you know, just complete knowledge of God. You know, if God knows that's everything, not, that's, that's omniscience. Omniscience, yes. Omnipotence. Omnipotence is power. Yes. Yes. Omniscience is knowing. Isn't but it? but he also has uh, omnipotence. Yeah, but that isn't that's irrelevant in this discussion, isn't it? I mean, maybe, but 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 well, let me finish. Let me finish. Um, but if you believe that God is God is all powerful and all knowing, then then it makes sense that He would know, you know, who is going to hell and who is going to heaven, you know, from from the moment yeah. you're even conceived of. Um, and so that makes sense. If then you draw from there, well, you know, if He knows everything, then it's just been ordained. There's nothing I can do about it because He is this all powerful being. And so he must have the power. Uh, to be able to do that for everybody, you know, because otherwise, if you're looking at it from a Calvinist point of view, then you're putting limits on God, because then you're putting yourself above God's will in a way, if you're saying, well, I can change it, um, if he already knows it, and he's already willed it, so. Oh, you convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> First time I've ever done that. You, you've articulated that philosophy very well. Of course, the, the weak link in that theory is that that God did that. There's mm-hmm. one thing that God could do it, which I don't disagree but that god would or did yeah isn't that really that that isn't that the weak point of their argument i think so because because what what they're arguing is the same thing that you always argue that he's omniscient and he knows the future Mm -hmm. but you're just saying well just because he knows it doesn't mean he's he's making it happen yes and they're they're arguing which was kind of what i was arguing well if he knows it then he then he can then he's made it happen Mm -hmm. i don't know that i argue i think but it's similar to that that's that's what you argued originally contrary to me no that that's that's what you said my idea was and that's what you were saying if he is omniscient then he's willed it so and you were saying that he can't be omniscient about the future that is true that is true that that, that is that was my argument yes but your argument is contrary to their argument yes because, because you're saying just, just because knowing... he knows it doesn't mean he's ordained it yeah He's just, um, he's just like that. Uh, he's, he's like an old guy who's watching an idiot uh, go down a sidewalk on a scooter, and he knows there's a rock like twenty feet away, and he, and he's, he says, he says to himself, he doesn't tell the guy in the scooter, he's gonna hit that rock and fall over, and and, and then he, he hits the, the rock and falls over, mm-hmm. but the old guy didn't cause it; mm-hmm. he just knew it was gonna happen. Exactly, exactly. But God, but God actually knew it because he saw it. Mm-hmm. Yes, interesting. Mm-hmm. So, uh, thank you for articulating the Calvinist view You're welcome. so effectively. And it, it just seems I don't know why I don't know why you'd choose to have that as your religion. Mm-hmm. You know, what 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 does it benefit you other than you're saying, well, now I know the truth. Okay, well, you know the truth. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like why why do you choose to be an atheist? Yeah. So let's say you're right about being an atheist. There's no fun in it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, yeah. okay, all right, you're an atheist. We're, you know, we're mm-hmm. all just going to die and go poof. No. Yeah. Well, yeah. What's the fun in believing it? Well, I know it's true. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, what's, what's, what, what's the difference effectively between a Calvinist and an atheist? I mean, I think Calvinism, I mean, you can be what very self-assured. What, what difference does it make? Well, I mean, I think I think you've pointed this out before, but I don't think you know any of us have ever met a Calvinist who's like, yeah, I'm the one, one of the ones who's going to hell. Of course, right. they all think that we're well, one of the ones who's going to heaven. And so, I think if you do believe in Calvinism, I think you do have a little bit of self assuredness, maybe. Of, well, I'm, I'm going to be one of the ones. I'm one of the ones, and so my life is is just set, and I'm I'm going to heaven. And I think you know we all hope that we do as Catholics, but we don't have that like we we don't have I think a mindset of guarantee. And I think a lot of the Calvinists can fall into a mindset of like it's guaranteed. We need to take this podcast on the road for an episode. We have to go to like a Calvinist convention. They must have like a council or something. Yeah. And we need to set up a booth and we need to interview as many people as we can, or maybe just like a man on the street interview of people coming and going and, and ask them, are you one of the chosen? You know, because they're all going to say oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <gasps> uh, that, that would be my, my idea of the, like a really fun Saturday. That would be like the best <laughs> Saturday ever. Get a whole bunch of Calvinists to say that they're the pre- predestined to go to heaven. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think I should openly mock people. I mean, I, I, I've never, I don't know if I've met any other Calvinists. And we had the author, mm-hmm. uh, I forget his name now. Oh, uh, Austin name. Freeman. Yeah, Mr. Freeman. He's, he, he volunteered that he's a Calvinist. Yeah. And 
Um, well, well, Calvinism is, is a part of a lot of Christian denominations. I think there's a lot of people who are uh, certain Christians who just don't realize that their Christianity is a Calvinist Christianity. Well, like he's, of, he's an avowed Calvinist, though. Yes. So I don't know that I've met, I don't know, I haven't knowingly met any other Calvinists. Yeah, well, I think a lot of Baptists are Cal Calvinists. A lot of the Baptist um, groups are, are very Calvinist. And there's there's different levels of destination. I forget what exactly. There's like double predestination um where it's yeah i forget how it all works um but there's there's different like people have taken it even farther than just the like the simple predestination um and they've applied it to like different aspects and stuff too and so it's an, it's it's a very big deal in a lot of a lot of christian denominations sounds like purgatory <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you have a different level then you gotta, you gotta upgrade somehow yeah, I mean, yeah I'll, I'll look up double predestination if you want to keep talking about no, yeah, okay. Wait, wait, wait. whatever what am I going to talk about? Okay, uh, Bible. Yeah, we've already talked about sola scriptura. Yeah, we kind of got ahead of that one. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the, the yeah the, the the there's a discussion of the tradition. Then Eck. Okay, I already talked about Eck having the debate. And uh, oh yeah, and then the gospel, the ending of jo Gospel of John, where he that Jesus said said and did many things that were not written down, hmm. which I just thought was just was really just a terrible thing to put in there because when you read that, every time I read that, I think, dang it, how hard it would have been for you to take better notes. You know, the guy is the Messiah. Yeah. Why couldn't you have summarized like everything he did? Mm -hmm. What, you didn't remember? <laughs> I mean, couldn't you, you could put your heads together and written down everything? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Anyway. All right. the, the, the uh, argument about the uh, tradition. Oh, you got some Calvinist theory yeah, stuff. I've looked up double predestination. It is what I thought it was. And I'm sure you'll like double predestination even more. So, so regular predestination is the belief that some people are chosen for heaven. Double yes. predestination is that some are chosen to be saved. And God also creates some people who will be damned. Like he creates them with the knowledge that they are going to hell. And their purpose, or not really their purpose, but their end destination for that soul is hell. And so it's not just I am selecting out of this group. It's I am selecting out of this group and creating the other group that's going to hell. I mean, it makes logical sense if if he if he's if if you believe in predestination mm -hmm. that that he's creating you to go to wherever you're going to end up going. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I mean I'm thinking you're either going to heaven or hell. Maybe maybe they believe some just extern you know are extinguished. Yeah. But it it just seems like such a horrible thing for God to do. Mm -hmm. Although. At least you had, I mean, it, and it really would really suck if you had a, a crappy life. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if you're at least able to enjoy yourself for like the 75 years you're here, you know, at least you got that yeah. until you, know, you die and he sends you to hell. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's especially rough because I, I think a little like a lot of the other Protestant faiths that, that do have a lot of Calvinist ideas, there is also a tendency to be like, well, you know, God's providence is also very active in your life. And if you have a lot of good things happen to you, that's a sign that you are one of the elect. And so if you're some poor schmuck who's just had a real awful life, you know, through no fault of your own, and you're a really avowed Calvinist, then you're going to think, oh, all of these bad things have happened. God's providence is not in my life. I'm also just going to hell. I'm one of those chosen to be to, to, to go to hell. Um, so it's like you know, kind that, of I think double jeopardy. I'm going to say this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to offend whoever would believe that. But that's a horrible, horrible philosophy. And that, that kind of like lines up with how I oppose those people that like they're, I always use this example, like their kid was lost or abducted and they, the kid is brought back and they say, oh, our prayers are answered. And I always feel bad for the parents who lost the kids because the, their prayers weren't answered, mm -hmm. you know, so to speak. And, and and I just find that a horrible philosophy. And, and for, I mean, how would you, if you lost a child to an accident or whatever, how could you even belong to that religion? Because the, the, you'd have to believe, well... Uh, you know, either they or I did God did not else. choose. Yeah, God chose yeah. not to help me here. You know, well, be... God chose that result because maybe uh, I was not a good person. I wasn't predestined. You know, like the pre the goods, the things that are happening to good people are because they're good people and they're chosen. And yeah. the, these things are happening bad to my, me and my family and my kids and my parents mm -hmm. because God chose that. Piss off. That's that's a horrible philosophy. Mm -hmm. no, that's borderline evil. Yeah, I agree. I think. I mean, um, I probably shouldn't say that, but that's a that's a bad. I don't know why you would think that. Yeah. What a what a what a crappy god. <laughs> yeah. Why do they worship that god? Yeah, that's a good. I mean, if, if if that's the god, why worship it? You know, I, I often think of 
I don't know, have I shared this before that um there there is a uh, a good argument that Satan is the creator mm. and God is the dissenting angel. Uh if if because the world is so screwed up, mm. but um God is like Lucifer, was one of the angels, and fought against the creator because the world was unjust. And he's doing everything he can to save and protect the souls in heaven from their ultimate destination to be re reunited with Satan in, in hell, yeah. what we call hell. Uh, and and so when I when I hear about people who have weird um, draconian religious beliefs, I often think you know I think they're kind of like they don't know it, but they're kind of worshiping Satan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, if you take the creator angle out of that, then you could just say, well, they're just worshiping Satan. They just don't realize it. Mm. I'm not saying all Calvinists are Satan worshippers, just so we're clear. But, but, but it's like if you have a belief that uh, God is purposely creating people just so they can be sent to hell for all of eternity, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a pretty, pretty not good entity. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, no, why, I agree. Why would you do that? And because the whole idea that we have is that you have a, a good and merciful God and, he, and God wants everybody to be with him in heaven. Mm -hmm. And it's only because people chose a different path and chose not to be, uh, do what is right and what is just and to be kind and loving and all that stuff. They end up, he has to, they, they condemn themselves to some other alternative. Yeah. Like a reluctant condemnation, although with a certain amount of righteous indignation because how terrible these people would, were mm -hmm. during their life. And they chose this path after having been warned, yeah, then I, that's a God I can believe in. Mm -hmm. But a God that will be like, yeah, fuck it, I just created this guy so we can go to hell. I mean, what, what the, what's the point? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't get it. I really don't. Yeah, that was a long rant. I was, I was hoping good, you to have some sort of car, uh, counter argument. But I, I don't have one. I mean, I, that, that's how I feel about double predestination. I think it's it's awful. I think it's it's a terrible philosophy. Yeah, I mean, it's just what a terrible way to to believe like predestination i can kind of wrap my head around if you really lean into the omniscience and the omnipotence of god but i mean i just can't re reconcile you know double predestination you know choosing mm -hmm. this person is going to hell from the beginning you know it's just i just can't 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 belong yeah. to that philosophy yeah no, i like i i really appreciate the concept of being able to get forgiveness at the end no matter how bad it was yeah even though yeah, i met some bad people in the over the life anyway so i don't know what else do i want to talk about this last section is a bunch of kind of ad hoc stuff i think uh so talk about henry the eighth being a militant catholic defending the the sacraments from this you know this uh, uh, criticism from the protestants thomas more similar uh, publishing stuff and defending the faith mm -hmm. uh, including often resorting to scatological abuse that's interesting um and and he had a historical rather than strictly theological defense of the church. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Moore argued that a vernacular Bible was unnecessary and that direct access to scripture could be dangerous for untutored people. I don't know if I agree with that, but but he certainly was a defender of the faith, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, Jacopo Sol Sol Sadoletto, mm -hmm. an Italian you. bishop in southern France, um let's see he said that he had been misled by crafty seducers who sowed doubt and division uh open letter to the Genevans urging their return to rome because they were seduced by these crafty people and, and he uh, explicitly eschewed subtle philosophy in favor of simple obedience to the word of god there's other people that they they he discusses like uh baronius and Bellarmine. Um, and his, his funny, the St. Robert Bellarmine, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. He died in 1621. He was an influential Catholic theo theologian, a Jesuit Italian, um, who presented a systematic case for the, tra for tradition and hierarchical authority. But even that document got put on the index. So that's like the, uh, isn't that the, uh, the, uh, catalog yeah, of forbidden uh, books. Yeah forbidden books that they had in the in the Vatican, but they wouldn't let it be published or, or, or circulated. Well, it's just a list of, yeah, yeah, books that you shouldn't read. He explains it a little later, actually. It's probably in the second half of the chapter what exactly the index was. Um, but it wasn't... No. Uh, 
No, I don't think so. But he says it wasn't so much of like, you know, read this and you will be punished by the church, but that it's imprudent to read this, probably not theologically accurate. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, there is a discussion of free will that I thought was pretty good. Uh, and, the, and the idea of the Protestant uh, criticisms and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what, what do we want to talk about that? Let me look at what do you want to say about that? I mean, I think yeah. it's it's important to, to point out like the Thomistic versus the Occamist uh, position that, you know, this is what the, the Catholics held, the, the Thomistic, that God's will is sovereign and he ordered the universe according to a rational pattern and gave men a limited free will. Um, and so, but he also does point out that, you know, in all of these discussions where you have all of these, you know, church leaders and different, you know, sort of factions splitting off, a lot of these deep theological issues just passed over most people. You know, so it just doesn't affect their way of life. You know, it's just, I'm just a dude trying to get to work. Um, but the the points of, you know, the, the, these people understood their faith primarily in terms of piety. So Marian devotions, cults of the saints, prayers for the dead, pilgrimages, the veneration of relics and indulgences. So we're talking a lot about, you know, free will and predestination. A lot of the time that doesn't really matter to people. It's the, what matters to people is how they pray and how they live out their faith. And so that's when they start getting upset. So you say, oh, you have this whole other group of people that thinks that I shouldn't be doing this thing that I've done every single day of my life. Well, of course, I'm going to be upset about that. They say I shouldn't pray to Mary, I shouldn't venerate the saints. You know, well, you know, I've been doing that for, for decades. You know, who are they to tell me what to do rather than caring about predestination or free will? It's more so those things that really, you know, sort of struck at the core of most people. Right. That's a good point, because the, the, the way the public was affected by this debate and this schism and, the, and these all these highbrow philosophical uh, discussions were, what do you mean? I can't I can't pray for my my departed ancestors yeah. you know i mean that's a that's a fundamental a pretty universal feeling yeah. among humans i think you know like like uh, try try telling like a, a parent who lost their kid yeah you can't pray for your child anymore purgatory doesn't exist he's probably just in hell it's like well that's, that's not going to be a compelling uh, philosophy for a lot of people yeah or or he's in heaven or hell you won't know yeah. until you're gone and god decided before he was born where he was going so just let it go you can't um, do anything about it yeah yeah. And then the, you know, the devotion of Mary, which I think we kind of go a little overboard on, but um, you know, that, that was, that's a big part of the Catholic church and had been at that point for hundreds of years. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, you can't pray to Mary. You got to get all these statues out of here. You, and, and then the, um, uh, what do you call them? I always forget the word for it. The uh, scraps of bodies of the saints. Relics. Uh, relics. Because of the relics had to be uh, in, in these newer, you know, uh, reformist areas. You know, get rid of those or just not venerate them because you know they have they have no power you know mm-hmm. and, and 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 people go uh, had been historically going on pilgrimages uh to see these relics and and to, to pray for intercessions and, and just practically speaking it just upended their entire way of life as far as their their religious beliefs so yeah. that must have been really really challenging for them and it must have been really hard for people to, to choose sides because how do you upend your entire uh, religious philosophy but I guess for a lot of others, it's kind of easy to let it go because it, the church had been so corrupted. Yeah, that's you know, and you see all these bishops abusing their authority and they're ch- cheating on whoever they were married to or doing whatever they want. And, and they're acting as civil authorities and, and just denigrating the entire institution of the church. Mm-hmm. So you can see why people are like, all right, right uh, yeah. I'll go along, go somewhere else because it's pretty bad. Yeah. So I don't know if there's anything else I want to talk about i did like this this brief mention of the failure of solo scripture that we we've talked about sort of at length now um but the point that i really like is he does mention you know almost from the beginning the leading reformers had to invoke some kind of church authority against the free interpretation of scriptures so it's like okay lean into solo scripture but you can't say okay yeah everybody interprets it personally there has to be some sort of authority structure and i really like the point that he makes um at the very end frustrated that the bible did not say explicitly what he was convinced it meant Luther added the word alone to Paul's proclamation that the just man lives by faith. Um, so the word alone is not in there. And he considered discarding the letter of James, which he called an epistle of straw, because it exalted good works. So very ironic that this guy's like, yeah, we, we need to be completely opposed to human innovation in theology. The scripture is the only thing. And he is adding human innovation to scripture itself. And it's like, I just think that's completely ridiculous. And I think shows just I think, you know, I, I agree with Luther on some points, you know, like the indulgences and everything I think was was it was an issue at the time. But you can see this how quickly he just went off the rails and just railed against everything Catholic to the point of ridiculousness that his that his own philosophy doesn't even line up with itself. Yeah. And, and he reminds me of the book Animal Farm, 
Mm. Uh, you know, like, like uh, where, where they said, you know, the pigs get in charge of this. It was, you know, all animals are equal, which some are more equal than others. Mm. And, and and so it's the same kind of idea. Once once you throw off the old, somebody else has to be in charge. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and if you're talking about the liturgy and the and, and scripture, uh, you know that that's it's it's kind of natural uh, result of throwing off the old without a plan in place beforehand. That's why those, that's why those councils of all those cardinals were always took so long because they are so important in trying to, to incrementally change a huge institution that's based upon this long tr- tradition. That's the strength of it too, because once you throw off the old, uh, somebody's going to create the new and that somebody may not be right, you know, and how do you decide? And that, that's what, that's what you're getting at is, is well, <clears throat> You know, if if we're just going to rely on scripture, then why the hell would we listen to you? You know, I could read it. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that's the that's the danger. That's the the brilliance of it and the danger of it. But if you have a religion, you know, uh, everybody has to generally agree on what you believe. Yeah, I uh, agree. Consensus. Mm-hmm. So I mean, if you don't, then you, it's not part of the religion. Yeah, there were a couple other interesting points I think here before we wrap up, just on this last page that we're going to cover today. Um, sort of the differences between Luther and Zwingli here a couple times. Yeah. Uh, one of those was the idea of uh, consubstantiation. You know, in the Eucharist, right. is that actually the body and blood of Christ? Luther says, um, uh, yes, uh, the, the bread and wine remains, but they also become the actual body and blood of Christ. Well, Zwing- Zwingli saw the bread and wine as mere symbols. Uh, the thing was adiaphora, uh, Lutherans accepting adiaphora, which means things indifferent, um, so long as the Bible did not explicitly forbid them. So you can do stuff yeah. that's not in the Bible, but Zwingli... Uh, said that you can only do things that the Bible explicitly authorized. So everything right. else is just wrong. So that's really where you get the concept of Puritans, you know, right. purifying everything that's not in the Bible. You also have Anabaptists, uh, which is kind of wild. I didn't know this was a thing. Um, but people uh, who, you know, they had, they had big crowds of preachers popping up at this time that were demanding that everyone be baptized again as adults, um, which led to their being called Anabaptists, which literally means baptize again. So Luther and Zwingli were united on that, saying, no, that's that's ridiculous. You've already gotten baptism. You don't have to have baptism again. Um, and of course, there were other um, spirituals who just kind of uh, proclaimed the, 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 the Lutheran principle of the freedom of the Christians, who bowed to no authority but God. And so there's just all of these other little sects that are sort of popping up at this time, all of these preachers that are just like, yeah, let's just do our own thing. Um, and of course, yeah. that's still what we have today. I mean, just all over the place. I think especially in the United States with all of these non-denominational churches that are just their own thing and aren't really tied to anything. Right. Although it seems to be there's a little bit of consolidation. I mean, some of those, like even regionally in, in our area, uh, those non-denominational churches, it seems like the the really successful ones, the effective ones, uh, seem to be getting bigger and bigger. And I think the, the smaller ones are struggling yeah, uh, with their membership because of that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the, those people believe or espouse. Mm-hmm. I have not been in any of them, so yeah, shouldn't probably say too much. True, but yeah, a good discussion. I think is pretty, what. What are your thoughts about um, Luther and the beginnings of the Catholic, uh, somewhat uh, Reformation, Protestant Reformation, and then uh, maybe a Counter Reformation? Yeah. No, I think this is this is probably one of the most interesting and I think easy to read, it, it, weirdly, chapters. I think in the next section, we have a little bit of more complicated stuff. We'll get into like the, the politics of like England at the time, which is just insane, just a complete back and forth. Um, right. But like the, the big questions here are interesting. I think this is probably the chapter that I knew like the most about um, out of any other chapter before going in, just sort of like the, the Reformation um, ideas. Um, but it's interesting to see see how he presents it. I think he does. He does a very fair job and explains it all well. Um but, but yeah, and I think it's it's one of the things he kind of mentions later. It's, it's, you know, this is sort of the time when Catholicism is really defined in the way that we see it today. Because I think so often now as Catholics, we're defining ourselves as how we're different from the Protestants. And mm-hmm. it's weird to sort of think about anything else, um, you know, because before this, you know, apart from the Eastern Orthodox, you know, there was just the Christians. And it's okay, right. we all kind of right. believe the same thing. That's just not a concept that we have anymore. Um, there's very basic core values that are held by all Christians. But other than that, it's just so different from just one church to the next, you know, really all over the world on a lot of like the the bigger theological issues. And I think that's that's a good point to consider. So like here's we're really seeing modern Catholicism. Mm-hmm. 
Good points. Thank you. What are your thoughts? I don't have any more. <laughs> you have no more thoughts? <laughs> I'm out. All right. Well, I guess that's a sign to, to end things. Um, you can, of course, follow us on Twitter at ULMTD Opinions. Again, that's ULMTD Opinions for updates on when our next episodes are live. Uh, but this has been Season 6, Episode 12 of Unlimited Opinions. I've been Adam Bishop. I'm still Mark Bishop. Great. Are you going to start your your own reformation, your own true church? Um, no, no, um, no. I think we do need a reformation of the Catholic Church. I don't, I don't know how to get it started, or or whether we'll get started. But um, I mean, the corruption is just horrible. True. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. Mm-hmm. Quite frankly, I think anarchy, true sola scriptura. Let everybody do whatever they want. I think that's that's the solution. That's never a solution to anything. <laughs>